Good evening. That was good. Welcome to the ninth annual Peter Scherer Memorial Lecture. I am Andy Rotter, the interim director of the Peace and Conflict Studies program and sort of the first of the introducers tonight, the first impresario. Uh, my main task is to thank people who made this work. Uh, all of you here for coming, of course. Dan Monk, the Cooley Chair in Peace and Conflict Studies who did the heavy lifting and planned much of this event. Amanda Stewart, our terrific AA, is there. Thank you so much, Amanda who handled the logistics with her usual aplomb, and especially to our speaker, Antoine Bousquet. Uh, most of all, and as ever, uh, the program faculty and I would like to thank uh, an extraordinary group of men, the friends and classmates of Pete Scherer, class of 1965, their donations, their energy, their commitment to this series has made this all possible. Uh, and in that spirit, let me introduce uh, Tony Pearl, who along with Rick Steggy has always been enthusiastically involved in this enterprise. Uh, Tony will say a few words about Pete Scherer. Tony. Pete Scherer was a wonderful guy. Uh, he was our friend, in some cases our fraternity brother, and he was very popular. He was president of the student body. He went on to an academic uh, uh, career where he advised uh, and taught many students. Uh, Peter had a passion for the peaceful resolution of conflict. Uh, that was unusual. We all graduated at a time of war. This was not a theoretical war. This was a very personal war. Uh, it influenced the uh, next several years of all of us. People like Dan Shuckers went into the Peace Corps. People like me got drafted and then got orders to Vietnam. Many of our friends were killed. In sponsoring this uh, lecture, we who lived through that with hindsight now believe that that was a great waste of life and resources. And we hope it won't happen again. And we hope through these series of lectures we can pass on to you Peter's passion for peace in what I believe is your very important studies and we hope that you will influence others the way Peter influenced us. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Tony. Um, could you please still your cell phones, if you have not already done so? Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Dan Monk, the Cooley Chair in Peace and Conflict Studies, who will introduce our speaker, Dan. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I'm only here to introduce the next person who's then going to introduce the next person who's next to the next person. And then uh, by that point in time, our speaker, Antoine Bousquet, is going to have gone to bed and uh, he'll tell us what he would have said tomorrow. Um, I just want to make, apologize that there was a kind of interesting misconnect here that I'd like to correct right here and right now as our speaker is actually of French origin, I always assumed that his last name was Bousquet, and then I was actually told by others that no, 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 he goes by Bousquet for some reason. So I informed my colleagues, no, 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 he doesn't go by Bousquet, he goes by Bousquet. And so everyone here has been trained not to call our distinguished speaker Bousquet, when in fact, and to call him Bousquet, when in fact he's a Bousquet. So from, from here on in, let's all just remember that it's Antoine Bousquet and that we've messed up yet again. Um, let me say very briefly that um, uh, to, to add to Andy's words of welcome and thanks, this is the ninth year that this amazing co-educational experience with Colgate alumni has, um, has uh, taken place. Each year, these gentlemen and uh, their significant, many, in many instances, significant others join us at Colgate in the fall, attend the lecture, read our distinguished guests' books and then come to a seminar the next day along with students and faculty uh, 
to um, um, participate in the tremendous gift that they've given you. So in that, with that spirit in mind, I want to sort of really try to set the tone for what we're, what we're about this evening. Um, in the course of World War I, at the very moment in history when war finally became total war for Europeans and white people, two theorists of new weapons um, and their use sought to anticipate the future of conflict. The first, named Giulio Duet, looked to the emergence of air power in warfare and concluded that because as a result of the invention of the airplane and the creation of a third dimension in war, um, the idea of a front in warfare would be erased and that would effectively mean that civilians could always easily be killed and for that reason warfare itself would have to be abolished. This, he argued, was unavoidable because um, air power presupposed the ability to bypass one's own military and one's opponent's uh, uh, military and to attack civilian centers of production. Looking at exactly the same scenario, the first great theorist of tank warfare, J.F.C. Fuller, concluded that the exact opposite was true. All war would henceforth become total war and it would be something like perpetual war um, with slave hunts, as he put it, as their model. Today we'd call this something like perpetual counterinsurgency. Since that time, students of war have repeatedly sought to understand the development of modern and contemporary warfare by linking its mode of conduct either to technical or to productive capacities of those who wage it. Histories of war typically organize themselves in relation to innovation, so quote unquote, in the implements of the organization of war. And I mention all this to underscore uh, and offer praise for the scholarly contributions of this evening's Peter C. Scherer Memorial Lecturer, Professor Antoine Bousquet, because Bousquet is really first among students of war in his efforts to assess how war making itself has um, uh, how war making itself has sought to understand the rationality of its own processes. In his remarkable book, The Scientific Way of Warfare, Bousquet painstakingly shows us how war has modeled its own understandings of the engines of its own rationality, first in terms of mechanics, then in terms of hydraulics, followed by cybernetics, and most recently on chaoplectic, is that right? Concepts, nonlinear organization. Professor Bousquet's book is a stunning achievement, but it highlights the problem that is inherent for us each year in selecting uh, a sharer distinguished speaker. Our speakers are regularly put into the same situation as Woody Allen's character in the movie Stardust Memories. If any of you have seen this movie, the, a Woody Allen-ish movie director is invited to a festival of his own films. And it's obviously flattering to him, but what also happens is that everyone comes up to him and, say, and says, I love your movies, especially the early funny ones. And so, in effect, we're asking Professor Bousquet to speak about his new material on the basis of the stuff that we really love that's already out. Now, it turns out, luckily for us, that Professor Bousquet has some new stuff, and so um, um, this is what we're going to hear about. I know that you're all pretty eager to hear about it. So let me do my job properly by saying that he is, in fact, senior lecturer in international relations in the Department of Politics at Birkbeck, University of London. His main areas of specialization cover war and society, political violence, the history and philosophy of science and technology, and social international political theory. He is, as I've mentioned, the author of The Scientific Way of Warfare, Order and Chaos on the Battlefields of Modernity, and uh, which is, as I mentioned, an inquiry into the influence of major scientific paradigms and key associated technologies on the conceptualization and practice of war in the modern era. He has also contributed to peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on subjects ranging from Cold War computing, the future of military organization, 
jihadist terrorist networks to complexity theory and international relations, the conceptualization and historical sociology of war, and violent spectaculars. Most recently with our colleague Jairus Victor Grove, he's completed a, a really excellent um, special issue of the journal Critical Studies of Security called Becoming Weapon. He is currently completing a second monograph on the logistics of military perception that is entitled The Martial Gaze. So please join me in welcoming Antoine Bousquet to Colgate University. Thank you, Dan. Well, first, I, I want to express some thanks of my own uh, to everyone here at Colgate who's made me so welcome, to PECON, and to, particularly to, to Dan Monk uh, for having invited me, to Amanda Stewart as well for, for coordinating all the logistics necessary, and of course uh, to, to the Peter Scherer Fellows who uh, have made this, this possible. When Dan first invited me, he, he talked to me about, about Peter, and it was quite moving to hear about how this individual, an exceptional individual by all accounts, uh, had touched all the people uh, who had studied with him and that they've decided to honor him in this way. And so it's a pleasure and, and an honor to be asked to give this uh, lecture. So. War just ain't what it used to be. In the good old days, armed conflict was considered to be a normal part of the course of interstate relations. It was a periodic event which would, uh, by which irreconcilable territorial claims might be settled. Ultimately, the fateful clash in which uh, great powers might rise and fall. In this period, the ability to wage war for entirely self-interested reasons was assumed to be an inherent prerogative of state sovereignty. War was also commonly celebrated as a uniquely noble, noble and virile activity in which men, indeed it was very much men, revealed their true character in the pursuit of glory for the mother nation. But today, territorial conquest is out. The 1945 UN Charter prohibits the use of force for anything other than narrowly defined instances of self-defense or collective security. Changes in territorial boundaries are, have become accordingly exceedingly rare. The case of Crimea recently, of course, is an exception in this regard and has been roundly uh, condemned by the international community and very few states around the world have accepted that new state of affairs. So this is really the exception rather than the rule today. States no longer formally declare war against each other. It might perhaps surprise some of you in this room that the US has not declared war on any other state since 1942, which may jar with what we understand the US to have been up to in military terms since that time. Indeed, if we look at the basis on which the US has waged war since 2001, it's on the back of a congressional authorization for the use of military force a single uh, act of Congress on the back of which the US has intervened in no less than 14 countries since 2001. Now this evolution in the political and juridical framing of war finds an echo in the self-understanding and self-presentation of military institutions. We used to have old ministries of war. Today they're called ministries of defense. The role of the armed forces has been redefined to include missions in peacekeeping, humanitarian intervention, and international policing. And even Strategic Air Command, an organization in possession of enough nuclear weaponry to lay waste to the planet in a matter of a few hours, insists that peace is its profession. Now, all this is provoked several commentators, among which Joshua Goldstein, John Horgan, or Steven Pinker, to conclude that violence and armed conflict are coming are in decline, perhaps 
terminally so. Hence the thesis of the end of war. War is coming to its conclusion. In support of this argument, these authors marshal an array of quantitative data. And indeed, some of it is quite persuasive. We might note, for instance, that over the modern period, over the course of five centuries or so, there has been a quite marked decline in the frequency of armed conflict between great powers, from a period where it was the norm to one in which it has virtually disappeared. And indeed, it's not simply conflicts between great powers. Interstate wars are extremely rare today. But a figure that perhaps these authors like to put most emphasis on is that of battle deaths. So deaths occurred in uh, armed conflicts. And if we look at these statistics over the course of the last 60 years or so, we can see both in, in absolute and in relative terms, let's say both rel relative to the global population and, and in absolute terms, we can see uh, a steep decline, indeed one that's become even more marked in the last 20 years or so. And indeed, again, we can see here that interstate conflicts, wars between states, the, the blue uh, bar, has also dwindled uh, to almost non-existence. Now, this metric of battle deaths is not without its problems, however. When we focus on fatalities, that can actually be quite misleading because it misses the increasing numbers of wounded who survive due to the progresses in medicine, sanitation, and the general improvement in the fitness of populations. As Tanisha Fazal has notably shown in her research, we can't assume that the ratio of uh, death to wounded remains the same. Indeed, uh, many more wounded now today survive their injuries. And then when, so when we start shifting our attention away from mere fatalities, we might get a fuller picture of what the toll of conflict still is today. So for instance, if we think about United States uh, interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq, about 5,000 Americans have died there. Now historically speaking, that's quite low. Uh, if we went back to the Vietnam War, we would find that 55,000 Americans lost their lives. But if we look more widely to the wounded, we would find that over a million Americans were harmed in some way or another in those wars, many of them suffering traumatic brain injuries from proximity to IEDs or other explosives. A third of veterans have been diagnosed with mental health problems. In total, over half of veterans from these wars have received government medical care. Nearly as many have applied for permanent disability benefits. So there is a colossal cost, and it will be a very long tail for that cost that is going to be paid by American society as a whole, both, of course, the individuals who have suffered these injuries, but also the cost of society that will have to support these individuals for the rest of their lives. And it, and it will be a very long cost when you bear in mind that the, the cost, the expenditure for medical care of Vietnam veterans is still increasing today decades after that conflict ended. But there's another kind of issue with the quantitative data that's presented to us by the uh, proponents of the end of war thesis that I want to draw your attention to. And that's that it's the way in which conflicts are defined within these data sets. So in order for a conflict to count as a war, you have to have a period of sustained combat in which a thousand people, at least a thousand people, die over the course of a year. Anything below that is not considered to be a war. So famously, the Falklands War between uh, the UK and Argentina does not rise to a, to a war because it's a little bit less than a thousand individuals died. But the problem with this definition, beyond the fact that some conflicts might slip under the radar uh, in this way, is that it presumes that war is a clearly bounded phenomena in space and time. And yet, that's precisely what has become increasingly difficult to determine today. Distinguishing spaces of war and spaces of peace is a growing challenge, as is the delineation 
of military and civilian spheres. And to this spatial dimension, we might add a temporal one. The temporalities of war have become blurred. It's not clear when wars begin or when they end. So I want to suggest to you today that we're not necessarily witnessing the end of war as organized violence per se, but rather the end of a certain conception of war, the conception of war that dominated uh, the Westphalian order of the modern era. And that what we are witnessing, rather, instead, is the emergence of a new constellation of organized violence. One that may be, at least for now, less lethal than the classical manifestation of war, but that carries its own dangers nonetheless. So to understand how we got here, I think we need to trace the evolution of war since the late 19th century. And I propose to do so through the figure of the battlefield that is so central to the classical conception of war. And I submit to you that this classical battlefield is in fact vanishing from view. So what then is this classical image of the battlefield? What comes to our minds when we think of a battlefield? Well, we might want to define it as a bounded physical space, typically a field in which densely concentrated armies meet by mutual agreement, or at least tacit mutual agreement, and clash for the duration of a single day. But the battlefield is not only a physical space, it's also a normative space, one that's distinct between the sp from the space of civilian life. Distinct in the sense that it becomes a space in which individuals are permitted to kill and to be killed, not by virtue of their individual identities, but through their association to a larger collective. So the battlefield can be a normative space in which normal rules that prohibit killing are suspended. And in fact, killing is actively legitimated under sp this specific association with political collectives. In the ideal, the action of a battlefield is to produce a decisive outcome, perhaps even one that determines the fate of the wider war and allows for the restoration of peace. So we find this idea of the decisive battle very present in the writings of the German theorist of war, Karl von Clausewitz, writing in the early 19th century. Clausewitz insists that you have to seek a decisive battle. You have to concentrate your forces in such a way as to, to obtain a decisive outcome and uh, be able to move from the time of war to the time of peace. Now, this traditional figure of the battlefield persists in our collective imaginaries. Just think about the various representations in media and film that depict this classical battlefield both in historical reconstructions or in more fantastical representations of the battlefield. That narrative speaks to us quite deeply. Yet in reality, this battlefield, or this idea of the battlefield, has all but disappeared from the contemporary landscape of war. Today, major battles with large concentrations of massed forces pitted against each other are increasingly rare. Infantry troops are typically scattered across terrain, moving in small units and involved in sporadic skirmishes. The last major tank battle took place over 25 years in the first Gulf War, and it was an incredibly one-sided battle at that. We haven't seen a large-scale naval battle since the end of the Second World War. Now clearly this disappearance of the major battle is evidently one of the significant factors in the decline of battle deaths. Uh, particularly under the age of industrial war, uh, battles occasioned many casualties, many fatalities, and as these battles have receded, so has uh, the level of uh, casualties associated with it. But that's not to say that military violence has disappeared altogether. In fact, 
persists, but with rather different modalities. The, what we see instead, increasingly, is the punctual unleashing of military violence that no longer conforms to any spatial contiguity or temporal continuity. Targeting appears truly globalized, designed to deliver lethal force anywhere a threat is identified. In 2004, we find in a classified memo authored by former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld the following claim. Today, the entire world is the battle space. And you find that claim rehearsed in a number of uh, forums. People argue this idea that there is a global battlefield. But to speak of a global battlefield is tantamount to saying there no longer is a battlefield in the sense of a distinct space both physical and normative, in which killing takes place. A global battle space is the same as no battle space. Again, the temporal dimension is significant too. Contemporary manifestations of war seem to lack clear temporalities. As I've already mentioned, declarations of war are no longer employed, and similarly, our armistices that would bring a war to an end also have gone out of fashion. Wars simmer on indefinitely, punctuated by sporadic operations and certainly not settled by an almighty clash of arms. It's interesting to turn perhaps for a moment to the terminology employed to describe or to brand, if you want, uh, many of the wars and interventions that have occurred since the beginning of the 21st century. So originally we heard about the global war on terror, which many people criticized on the basis that it wasn't quite clear how you could wage a war on a noun or an emotion, or how you could ever determine that a war on terror was won. But perhaps even more revealing is the Obama administration's decision to try and distance itself from the term of war on terror, and in suggesting its own terminology. Overseas Contingency Operations. That says everything you need to know. These are contingent operations that can take place at any moment, whenever it's necessary, and at, with an open-ended horizon in terms of where they might potentially, or if they might ever end. Another significant feature of uh, this new modality of organized violence is that the traditional anonymous and accidental enmity of soldiers, that's to say that soldiers fought one another because they fought under a flag, not because they knew who they were as individuals, this is increasingly giving way to the targeting of specific individuals on the basis of either their known identities or at least their observed patterns of behavior and association. All of which may well suggest that the battlefield is in a state of terminal crisis and with it a certain conception of war. Now in truth, the battlefield has been in crisis for quite some time. While the classical model of the battle was still absolutely dominant in the Napoleonic era, perhaps in retrospect it was its apogee, by the second half of the 19th century, commentators were already noting a creeping extension of the battlefield and a growing dispersal of troops within it. By the time the First World War had settled into protracted trench warfare, the battlefield was looking like a very different place. Key to this transformation was the increased range, accuracy, and therefore lethality of firearms that was made possible by the technological innovations of barrel rifling, conoidal bullets, and smokeless propellants. So earlier muskets of the type that might have been used in the Napoleonic Wars could not exceed ranges of, or aimed ranges of around 75 meters. But by the First World War, snipers could hit targets at distances of 300 meters. And today, 
distances of 1,200 meters are fairly standard ranges at which firearms can be aimed effectively. A similar story can be told for artillery. During the American Civil War, you could effectively only fire a cannon at a target that you could visually see. Whereas by the First World War, you could reach targets located as remotely as 20 kilometers. So this increase in the range and in the accuracy of firearms and artillery had two important consequences. The first is that it dramatically increased the vulnerability of exposed forces. If there was no protective cover available, concentrations of forces would draw attention and risk incurring large losses from aimed fire. The second consequence was there was a reduced need to mass forces in order to have effects. So in the age where firearms were quite primitive, where you couldn't really take aim at, at, at any uh, longer distance, the most effective way that was devised to use firearms was to line troops up in uh, firing lines and to get them to coordinate their fire so that they would deliver volleys of lead at the enemy. Just a kind of mass effect. There was no point of aiming. Once you've got more advanced, more accurate, more far-ranging weapons, sniping tactics become uh, very effective, trained marksmen can be deadly, and you no longer need to concentrate forces. So these two combined effects, the, reduced, the increased vulnerability of mass forces and the reduced need for mass forces in order to have effects, contributed to a rapid and dramatic emptying of the battlefield, perhaps most symbolized by the so-called no man's land of the First World War, a space between the fronts which was occupied by no individuals and in fact was a lethal killing field for anyone who stepped onto it. Now this correlated process of expansion of the battlefield and disperse, dispersal of forces only intensified over the course of the following hundred years. And so we can see that from the First World War onwards there is a dramatic increase in the size of area of operations, in the length of the front, and in the depth of the rear. And of course, there's also a volumetric expansion into the airs. The, the, the advent of manned flight means that increasingly you can use, there's a vertical dimension that opens up uh, and that the battlefield truly becomes a battle space. So we can see here in this, this chart that goes from antiquity to the Persian Gulf War, that although it did increase uh, in some way up to uh, the First World War, thereafter quite dramatic increases take place. And we see a, a, an increase in the areas in which combat is conducted and a fall in the density of the occupation of the battle space, the space that each soldier might cover. All of this is accelerated by two further factors. The increased mobility of forces permitted by motorization, that once you equip motors on vehicles, then you can move around the battle space much faster, you can range at much greater distances. And you also have, of course, the development of information and telecommunication technologies that allow for the coordination of remote units. If you, if you didn't have telecommunications, you wouldn't be able to retain any kind of coherence in the arm, in armed forces if you once you disperse them. This increased accuracy of targeting uh, has become particularly pointed in uh, the use of aerial bombing in the last three decades with the development of precision guided munitions, whether they're laser guided or GPS guided. So we go from requiring around 9,000 bombs in the Second World War to destroy a target, and here we're, we're talking about a, a target the size of a building, to one, maybe two munitions required to destroy a target today. So the economy of force is completely transformed. But something else also happens in the 20th century 
that contributed to dissolve the boundaries between spaces of war and peace and between military and civilian domains. War increasingly becomes total, which is to say that it calls upon the sum of a nation's industrial and popular resources. Fighting wars is no longer the sole task of the military. Entire societies have to be mobilized to contribute. The First World War was a, a step in this escalation, and a further stage was reached in the Second World War, particularly through the idea of the home front. So that the front is no longer simply where two armies meet, but there is a home front, a domestic home front, where the war is being fought and, de and decided. So here we have a couple of posters uh, from uh, United States and Britain that both make that idea of the home front concrete. On the one hand, by drawing a clear analogy between the soldier in, on, uh, at the military front and the laborer, whether it be in industries or in agriculture, whether it be a man or a woman, who are seen to be contributing in just an import, as important a way to the war effort. Or it might be a reference to the big guns of the home front, where the factory in which weapons are produced are just as important as the use of these weapons on the field. And what's striking this period in the Second World War is that this idea of the home front is shared across all parties. All combatants accept this idea of the home front. So here, for instance, we have two posters from Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia that express very much the same idea. You are the front, the Nazi poster says. Soviet poster says, everyone to the front. So in this period, victory increasingly appears to hinge on the superior mobilization of one's society, on the ability for industrial and logical infrastructures necessary to support military, the military's actions to endure. And as a matter of fact, what we see is that this home front, this in, these industrial resources, these popular resources, become the determining factor. Battles, however great the tactical successes, are no longer seem able to settle wars. So it's been noted that the German army, actually in many ways, had accomplished significant tactical advantages over the Allies, notably in the beginning of the war through its use of Blitzkrieg, but also the general training and the quality of the equipment was uh, in many regards superior. But in the end, that mattered for little, because the Soviet Union and the United States were able to call on far superior industrial and popular resources so they could just grind it out. They effectively wore down Germany. Tactical success no longer meant strategic victories. But of course, if industries and populations become the determining factor in war, they also become the targets. And so of course, in this period, we see the development of strategic bombing, a strategy in which air power is directed towards degrading the adversary's war-making capabilities. And a strategy that was most developed by the Allies in the intense bombing of both Germany and Japan in the final years of the war. In order to proceed or to prosecute these campaigns of strategic bombing, the Allies had to conduct extensive studies of the enemy state's industrial base and infrastructural choke points so that you could prioritize uh, targeting. So here we have uh, a classified index of targets produced by the uh, US Joint Target Group of an area in Japan in which we find listed uh, a range of industries, aircraft manufacturers, chemical plants, coal mining sites with coordinates and with uh, uh, target numbers and references. All in order to permit the methodo methodical dismantling of the Japanese economy and ultimately foundation of military power. Simultaneously, the morale of populations is increasingly attacked in the belief 
that it will engender a collapse in popular support for their political regimes. So in this illustration of the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, we see a visualization of the effect of strategic bombing. And in fact, it says that, well, the more Germans we kill, more German civilians we kill, wound, evacuate, destroy their homes or deprive of utilities, the more we undermine their will to resist and ultimately to continue fighting. Indeed, as the campaigns of strategic bombing proceeded, the efforts to dismantle the economic and logistical base of the enemy proved inconclusive, partly because bombing, as I indicated to you earlier, wasn't really as accurate as the planners would have liked. And so what really followed in the final stages of the war was a bombing campaign that became indiscriminate and geared towards the annihilation of civilian populations. We could observe, for instance, that on one night of March 1945, the firebombing of Tokyo caused the death of 100,000 civilians. That's more than either, the, either of the atomic bombings that followed later that year. So I think it's important to note, to understand that the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were merely a continuation of the logic of mass civilian targeting that was already in place uh, for a year or so prior to those bombings. And of course, the Cold War that followed the Second World War was itself a further extension of that logic. Although the nuclear superpowers soon determined that a full-blown nuclear war or military exchange, which would mean nuclear war, needed to be averted, the only means that they found to do so was to plan every detail of such a conflict. That's the basis of the strategy of deterrence, which culminates in uh, so-called mutually assured destruction, or MAD. The assumption here is that the only way you can deter an adversary of using their own nuclear weapons against you is to convince them that you have a retaliatory capac capacity and will that will annihilate their societies if they ever attack. So immediately after the Second World War, the United States military began work on planning for such a war, which meant collecting the same kind of information they had painstakingly assembled during the Second World War about the logistical and industrial uh, basis of uh, the Soviet Union and its allies. So they began work on what became known as the bombing encyclopedia of the world, in which various or the sites across uh, Eastern Europe and the communist world uh, were catalogued. The primary objective of this encyclopedia, in the word of one of its initiators, was, and I quote here, to conduct a pre-analysis of the vulnerability of the USSR to strategic air attack and to carry that analysis to the point where the right bombs could be put on the right targets, concomitant with the decision to wage the war without any intervening time period whatsoever. So the idea is we must be able to wage full total war at a moment's notice. By 1960, the encyclopedia contained around 80,000 target listings across the Soviet Union, China, and the Soviet bloc. The Cold War therefore installed a set of institutions and rationalities that were directed towards the initiation of a global nuclear war at a moment's notice, one that would have scarcely distinguished between civilian and military targets. In 1961, Strategic Air Command produced what it called the Single Integrated Operational Plan, which called for the delivery of 3,200 nuclear warheads to over 1,000 urban, industrial, and military targets in communist countries. Estimated death toll 285 million. Yet while the Cold War was defined by the permanent horizon of a global war that would have happened everywhere at the same time, it's in fact a different spatial temporality of conflict that is emerging in its wake. One in which war definitively gives way to temporarily discontinuous and geographically disparate states of violence, to use the French philosopher Frédéric Gros' terminology.
these states of violence are punctual eruptions or lacerations of violence that could happen anywhere at any time and momentarily, momentarily conjoin dis distant points on the globe. The US Air Force likes to boast that its nuclear and conventional precision strike forces can credibly threaten and effectively conduct global strike by holding any target on the planet at risk and, if necessary, disabling or destroying it promptly, even from bases in the continental United States. So this is a, a, a program for a, order of, a global order of targeting. And it's a global order of targeting that is increasingly granular and individualized. And we can think about this individualization of targeting through the evolution of the military concept of the kill box. In American military parlance, a kill box refers to three dimensional areas that are designated as free fire zones. So areas, delineated areas in which uh, forces can engage the enemy at will. Now the first use of the kill box concept was deployed uh, in the 1991 Gulf War. And back then, it referred to vast volumetric areas, probably about average, on average the size of New York City, which were to be patrolled for the aerial interdiction of Iraqi forces. But what's interesting is what happens to the kill box as we move into the era of the global war on terror. Instead of these large spaces that are allocated to, in the context of interstate, recognized interstate wars, what we find are the use of these boxes to determine areas in which force is going to be used against targets perceived to be threats to national security that are occurring outside, or that are located outside of recognized war zones. And these targets are frequently single individuals whose identities or patterns of behavior or association mark them as fit for elimination. I'm thinking here, of course, of the policy of so-called targeted killings, which have been pursued in uh, the last stages of the Bush administration and then with greater intensity under the Obama administration. And so these strikes, of course, have been controversial, notably because they take place in areas which are not recognized uh, areas of conflict, such as Yemen, Somalia, or Pakistan. And the US's defense of that is to say that all these strikes are part of a single armed conflict. That they're all part of this war on terror and that has an indeterminate <laughs> geography, potentially globally distributed. So whereas the exercise of armed force used to traditionally occur within an existing battle space or war zone, it is now increasingly the presence of the target, wherever that may be, that justifies the use of, the f of force in that location. The kill box works as a means to open up a space, often for the briefest of intervals, during which force can be deployed, and a space which tends to contract to the scale of the singular body of an individual target. So this individualization of targeting has seen the US move towards redefining what the legitimate space of war is as effectively wherever a designate, designated target finds itself. So again, the target determines the space of war offers a legitimize, legitimates the use of force as opposed to a prior conception where you first have a space of war and then targets can be identified within that space of war. Alongside this, we see a shift in the rationale of targeting away from status-based targeting against units, formations, and equipment to identity-based targeting that might take place against individuals or perhaps cells and networks 
of individuals. This contemporary spatial character of warfare is further complicated by the fact that, in many cases, the remote operation of weapon systems takes, uh, occurs through control posts that are located thousands of miles away. So, for example, uh, in New Mexico, where pilots and operators of drones step into uh, these air-conditioned uh, containers and effectively find themselves in Pakistan or Afghanistan through the telepresence enabled by these technologies. So the operatives find themselves simultaneously in two spaces, both in that uh, space of war, uh, wherever they are being projected, and of course the pacified domestic space in which they physically reside, very often meaning uh, the uh, daily commute they take back to their family homes. This new spatial geography also entails establishing a ra radical asymmetry in the reciprocal exposure to risk that was traditionally assumed by combatants. So although it's always been uneven, it has throughout the history of war been an assumption that all the participants in a conflict were in some shape or form risking their lives. Today, the asymmetry has been radicalized. The risk is virtually non-existent for the operator of a drone, and the risk is entirely on the would-be target. This is what prompts Grégoire Chamayou to say that the use of armed force today increasingly no longer resembles the model of war, but rather the model of the hunt. That the relationship between the drone pilot and his target is that of a predator to a prey. In fact, no coincidence that uh, one of the names that the drones, that American uh, UAVs has received is the predator. But it's important to understand that in doing so, in setting up this radical asymmetry, this model of the hunt, we are compelling the hunted to adopt ever more radical forms of concealment, which is the other face of the current dissolution of the battlefield. Now, of course, there have been long-standing efforts to counter the vulnerability uh, of the exposure induced by increasingly accurate and far-ranging weaponry. And of course, it's quite striking the extent to which these techniques, in fact, resemble that of the predator-prey interactions in nature. So it's no coincidence, of course, that at the turn of the 20th century, at the very moment where weapons become much more far-ranging and much more accurate and therefore deadly, that we see a rapid sh shift in the way in which uh, armies uh, dress themselves. We see a disappearance of the bright, conspicuous uniforms that prevailed in the 19th century to dull colors, earthy colors, that attempt to blend the wearer into their surroundings. This is, of course, the birth of modern camouflage, which, again, has its equivalent in the natural world. And thereafter, we see an increasing sophistication of camouflage, the co creation of disruptive patterns that purpose purposefully use markings and color contrasts to break up the form of the body and to hinder its recognition. A further technical, technological evolution arises from the extension of military perception across the electromagnetic spectrum. So the development of infrared and radar technologies of sensing induce countermeasures, namely the constitution of stealth technologies that seek to reduce the vulnerability or the ability to detect uh, using these new means of perception. So here we have a, a model of the F-117 that is being tested for its radar cross-section. But in addition to these technical countermeasures, we also encounter more fundamental and even radical sets of responses, which I put to you are the ones that are coming to the fore 
today. These are strategies that we might summarize as those of generalized concealment, dispersion, and expendability. The first of these, or the first measure we might consider is the attempt to shift the arena of conflict to physical terrains in which the means of military perception and its processes of targeting are significantly hampered. So this is not new really. We've seen for some time, of course, that uh, shifting the terrain of combat to jungle environments, to forested uh, milieus, or to mountains uh, provides valuable cover, concealment to uh, considerably weaker forces from their more technologically advanced enemies. In our 21st century, which is characterized in, uh, in part by rapid urbanization, the city is emerging increasingly as the environment that provides the clutter of concealment, as the space in which asymmetric opponents take the battle to, because they know that they, there as well they can negate significantly the advantages that uh, modern weapon systems possess. Finally, there's the possibility of moving underground, uh, something that the Viet Cong used to great effect during the Vietnam War, to such an extent that they were able to build tunnels Amer uh, under American bases without detection for years. But there is a second approach that can be taken, one that's characterized by the adoption of principles of dispersion and expendability. Now, for some time, since the 1990s, the American military has become very interested in the concept of swarming. The premise of swarming is, again, a radicalization of the dispersal of forces on the battle space. It's the idea that you can distribute forces widely across the battle space, and you can coordinate them so that they will, at short notice, pulse against an enemy target and disperse again. This idea of swarming has recently received new attention because of the developments in robotics and drone technology. So that a number of research programs are now premised on developing very large numbers of small, cheap drones. Some analysts forecast that in the future, potentially billions of insect-like drones could be produced and unleashed. And of course, the benefit of these is that they're cheap. They are likely to overwhelm any sensors who will not be able to distinguish all of them. And certainly, no weapon system is going to be able to take them all out. But their coordinated action could make them into very effective offensive weapons. But again, swarming is not something that's only practiced by the most developed states uh, and their advanced technology. Nation state actors already employ swarming in a much more low-tech fashion. When we look at the uh, attacks coordinated in Mumbai in 2008 or in Paris in 2015, what we see are dispersed groups of individuals spread across the city, communicating with uh, each other, uh, co uh, committing coordinated air attacks, and overwhelming, for at least a time, domestic security forces. And of course, there is also the low-tech version of the strategy of expendability that's manifested in the suicide bomber, which covertly weaponizes the body and is exceedingly difficult to stop when the individual, individual is willing to expend their own life. Finally, there's the strategy of generalized concealment what the Iranian philosopher Reza Negrestani calls hyper-camouflage. Now, it's worth noting that in conventional military terms, military camouflage is restricted in some important ways. And there's a paradox here, perhaps, because camouflage is obviously designed to not be perceptible. But at the same time, it's constrained by the laws of war that require that forces identify themselves as soldiers. They have to wear recognizable uniforms. 
they cannot disguise themselves as civilians or as the enemy, which would be great forms of camouflage. So militaries are having to simultaneously produce uh, uniforms that are supposed to conceal soldiers, but they must also advertise their presence in other ways. But of course, this is a constraint that doesn't avail in the case of hyper-camouflage, which adopts a silent and fluid military infiltration of civil society by antagonists who endeavor to veil their intentions until the very moment of their assault. Negorostani contends that hyper-camouflage participates in a process of endo-militarization of peace that dissolves any notion of the battlefield as a delineated space, collapsing the respective categories of war and peace and the spheres of the military and the civilian. In turn, the state who has to contend with this strategy of hyper-camouflage being used against it, that state is tempted to place its citizenry under ever greater suspicion so that the state in turn enacts, as Negarastani puts it, its own retro-militarization in which its teeth flow back down the tail. Therefore, hyper-camouflage in turn draws processes of targeting back to domestic societies conceived as battle spaces in potentia. There was quite a revealing controversy a few years ago where the former Attorney General Eric Holder got into a bit of bother because he, he wouldn't rule out the fact that the United States might use a drone strike on its own territory. And following the controversy, he, he insisted that there was no plan whatsoever uh, to do so, but except perhaps in what might constitute exceptional circumstances. But of course, the world in which we live in, that of the war on terror, is one in which spaces ex of exceptionality are constituted all the time. Finally, the latest operational concept that is gaining ground in the US military is, I think, here quite revealing. I introduce to you the combat cloud. The combat cloud is an operational concept that draws its inspiration from civilian applications of cloud computing. And with, within cloud computing, the idea is you pull and you distribute computer processing resources uh, and data via the internet so that it can be channeled to meet the immediate demands of users, wherever they may be. The combat cloud emphasizes the centrality of network connectivity and data management as well. But what it wants to produce is highly distributed operations that are able to spontaneously access relevant information and assemble the necessary capabilities to nullify any emergent threat, regardless of where it may be. Its chief proponent is General David Deptula, who tells us that linking operations across all domains with accurate information can be the basis of creating an omnipresent security complex that is self-forming and, if attacked, self-healing. This kind of complex could enable a deterrent effect that would induce stability wherever employed or achieve decisive outcomes if forced application is actually required. So perhaps we are leaving the age of war. Perhaps war is ending, but in favor of a new age of omnipresent security of global targeting and pervasive lethality in which the uh, unforeseen eruptions of violence may occur anywhere. Of course, it would be senseless to pine for a time in which thousands lost their lives in battles over the course of a single day. But it is also true that whatever tentative progress was made in normatively constraining the violence of war was realized by bounding its exercise in delineated space, spaces and times. So the whole construct of the laws of war is premised on this idea that you can distinguish between spaces of war where certain legal frameworks will apply and domestic spaces. The problem here, of course, is that the new modalities of violence in the 21st century no longer seem containable in this way. 
And so this presents to us new challenges, calls for different responses that I think we are still struggling to even formulate today. Thank you. I'm sure that uh, Professor Bousquet is more than willing to answer questions. I know some of you have to go, and I'll invite you, those of you who have to go to leave quickly and quietly so we can pass to Q&A. Quickly and quietly. For those of you who are remaining for q and For those of you who are remaining for q and I just want to ask you to please um, wait until we can hand you a microphone. Some of you are convinced that your voices project but not when we try to actually put this up on the internet. So wait for the microphone to ask your question. And I'm sure you're ready to sure. take some questions. Sure. Uh, and you can field your own questions or need me to point them out. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to point out. Okay. You're all set. The first is always the hardest. Come on, don't be shy. Many, if not so, all of me. your examples, sorry, many, if not all of your examples of aggression were of the American armed forces. Mm. Uh, is the same mirrored in the Chinese, Russian, and European armed forces? I think the reason why the focus is today on the United States, because I think the United States is at the cutting edge of that. The United States uh, has still an unparalleled advantage over other states of the world when it comes to its military capability, and notably its cutting edge technology. I mean, just to uh, give you an idea, only a few years ago, the U United States military was spending on R&D as much as the U Russian military is spending on its entire army, its entire expenditure. So. The technological edge is considerable, and it's being pushed quite clearly by the US military. Uh, this is, I think, where, let's say, the action is happening. But of course, the problem is that the US is creating precedents that very likely other states will follow. Um, and we know that the Chinese are both constructing drones and selling them in large numbers, so these may are being bought by a number of states who may also adopt those. Again, in context, they may be much less reluctant than the United States, for instance, to use drones in their domestic countries. Um, so at the moment, I think, as I say, a lot of things are being advanced, pushed forward by the United States. But there's no doubt that there will be, uh, this will be replicated elsewhere. And, it, and what, we, what we are contending with is the fact that certain established norms about the understanding about how war is to be conducted are being eroded, partly through the actions that we're seeing, and that was likely to have consequences in the long run. Hi. Um, I'm wondering that with regards to like Edward Snowden in terms of like releasing government files, it sort of released its own sort of cyber warfare, even though no, there were no casualties technically. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of like individuals who come forward like that, who created their own sort of warfare, but no necessary like casualties involved. Are you saying that Edward Snowden conducted cyber warfare? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Well, I mean, uh, well, uh, then <laughs> just clarify what you think, what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think so, personally. Okay, All right. Um, you mean by, as, uh, what Snowden did cons constitutes an attack on the US government, is that what you would say? <laughs> well, I think uh, we should be careful with the way in which we bandy the term cyber warfare because I think it gets used extremely loosely nowadays and that's not very helpful I think to, to understand what we're talking about. I think what, without trying to get into the kind of ethical arguments about whether what Snowden did, did, did can be justified or not, <laughs> arguably Snowden conducted a form of espionage. He re acquired information uh, that he, well maybe he was entitled to access but he certainly wasn't entitled legally to distribute. 
so I don't think that should be con 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 constitutes an act of war in a sense if we still think that war is a violent action that results in destruction and death. Now, of course, you can make claims about the causality that you know he revealed information that maybe you know, someone lost their life as a consequence, possibly. But but I think that's quite circuitous. So um, I would I would approach what you're saying by saying that Snowden brings to our attention the fact that uh, we live in, in a world where because of the increasing amount of information floating around, increasing in, in us, including both the capability of governments to acquire that information, but also the ability for individuals to leak that information, uh, we find that uh, very, that's individual actors can have potentially great influence uh, on the course of events through the access of that information and through uh, its distribution. And that, that's one of the challenges that states face today, and, and I think arguably are quite unprecedented. Two things. One is, um, wh what significance uh, do you uh, uh, do you uh, apply to the recent uh, Russian uh, show of force? Um, apparently, Putin did a uh, kind of a, a dramatic parade of uh, armaments and uh, uh, probably some more sophisticated uh, current current uh, uh, devices. And also, uh, second second part would be: uh, Can you comment on the situation in North Korea and? In any way, um, I'm not sure how to how to define that question, but I'll leave it to you. Mm -hmm. you. Well, I, I guess I'll approach it in terms uh, that my central contention that the battlefield is disappearing and that conventional battles are not happening might be falsified tomorrow by a major interstate war, maybe Russia, maybe North Korea. I think clearly we can't exclude that these things could happen. Although I, it seems until now, and I think it's still operative today, that nuclear weapons have, in many, in many instances, act as a significant break on the possibility of interstate war. That rational parties, when they confront the reality of the situation, realize the stakes are too high, and there's, you know, this, is a, this is the kind of conflict where everyone is going to lose out. So I think it's, it's provided a, a constraint on the ability for war to escalate to what we would consider total war, to what we saw in the Second World War. Now, some parts of the developing world have been on the receiving end of what, for all intents and purposes, is total war. If you're Vietnamese, you experience total war. But developed states haven't gone to total war with one another because it would likely mean their mutual annihilation, or even in the case of North Korea, where it wouldn't be mutual annihilation, it, it would be significant destruction, and certainly for South Korea, and, and potentially quite painful for the United States as well. And I think that's part of the story because that led the Soviet Union and the United States to compete in all sorts of ways that remained that, that ensured that it remained be, be, below the level of total war. But in doing so, it kind of promoted the pursuit of military force or military influence through, you know, more subversive, more subterraneous uh, areas. Um, and I guess this is partly what contributed to the dissolution of the battlefield. That we, have, we had 50, 60 years of a Cold War in which these states were prepared for war, built up huge bureaucracies, administrations, resources, militaries, prepared to fight war, both conventional and less conventional. And in the aftermath of the Cold War, well, the Russians have fallen to the wayside, at least for a while, and the United States has been left with a huge capability that it has sought to repurpose hasn't really dismantled it in any meaningful way. And the war of terror has produced a new narrative, a new end towards which to project that, that capability. And so it's leading us to these very asymmetric types of conflicts where the United States doesn't fight, fight peer competitors, at least not directly, but is engaged in this radically asymmetric form of war, which is also being experienced as a challenge from you know, various parties around the world who don't want to submit to American authority. <laughs>
So it seems to me that this whole idea of targeting specific people is kind of ineffective, like especially in wars that we see today because they are fought on such a basis of ideology and just getting rid of like, you know, a leader or something, like getting rid of Osama bin Laden didn't get rid of, of terrorism. If anything, it made it stronger. So why do you think we put such an emphasis on that and are going in a direction that is so focused on this targeting of individuals when it doesn't seem to be effective? Um, well, there's several things to say. First of all, I think we have to understand what the constraints under which uh, that define the kind of problem space for the United States. As long as the US is committed to using, uh, it's projecting armed force abroad, it has to do so operating within a certain number of constraints. One of the chief constraints is the profound aversion to c casualties. I mean, that's remarkable, that has changed remarkably over the course of the last 50 years or so. Uh, we saw that relatively small numbers of fatalities in Iraq and Afghanistan, small when we think about it compared to the, the terrible death toll of the first half of the 20th century, was quickly considered to be intolerable by the American public and forced the United States to effectively pull out these conflicts. So there's a, there's a need to reduce uh, casualties. And remote warfare technology is seen to be the solution to square that problem. And from that perspective, drones are very appealing because the risk is pretty much zero. And it, but it still allows you to project force internationally. The targeting of individuals is also appealing, partly because it potentially reduces so-called collateral damage, which is also part of the legitimacy of these campaigns. The American public will support it as long as it, it doesn't want to feel that there's indiscriminate targeting. It's important for the military to convey the notion that it's doing as much as it can to reduce civilian casualties, even if these are very contested areas. But there's emerged also a belief that we can, that, that, that by rooting out individuals, that the enemy is a network, and if you want to get rid of networks, you have to extirpate it by killing off different nodes within that network. And that today, there are the means to both identify these individuals and target them. But you're absolutely right. The results so far are not very conclusive. It seems to have to be, in fact, a kind of self-generating process by which you may kill individuals, but you also mobilize or radicalize further others to join the cause. So it's not clear that this uh, mode of operation becomes, if anything else, than a kind of form of continuous risk management. So the, the risk is that this form of targeting is, in, is, uh, is in the indefinite. It, and generally, it becomes also, you have to understand the logic of it, is that very often it's premised on the basis of a notion of preemption. The problem is we have to identify these individuals before they become a threat to the United States. And so there's assumptions built in about what these individuals will do in the future and therefore why they need to be targeted now. And that logic is potentially without end. So I'm just curious, uh, how does AI or artificial intelligence factor into this and how do you make those conclusions based on a lot of the advancements in that field are highly classified? Mm -hmm. Well, we should already understand that there's a heavily algorithmic basis to many of the targeting decisions that are being made. Some of the information that's been, so, it, so there, again, there are two forms of, of targeting that generally prevail today in targeted killings. One is where individuals are well known, intelligence agencies have generally gathered quite a lot of information, they have a fairly clear idea of who these people are. Uh, but the vast number, vast majority of targets are people that are not known in detail to intelligence services. They're people who've been observed either through their telecommunications, very often not the content of their telecommunications, but where, whether they've been in contact with other people that have been identified as potentially uh, threats, whether they do suspicious things such as carry weapons, which is what a lot of people do in a tribal, uh, in, north, uh, in northwest Pakistan, in the, in the tribal lands there, if they cross the border very often, or if they do any number of things that are, have been coded as being potentially a risk. So that leads to people reaching it, or, or that leads to systems that eventually produce individuals that are deemed to be a threat and may become targets. So 
But what, very often when we talk about AI, of course, we think about autonomous uh, killing machines, which has been prompted by debates about drones and so on. That may happen at some point, but I think that's still quite remote. The technology is imperfect, and in fact, the military doesn't particularly want to take <coughs> humans completely out of the loop. It wants some form of oversight. It wants some form of chain of command or responsibility to which these decisions can be assigned. But what we're seeing, I think, is increasingly AI taking or guiding uh, the oper operatives towards their decisions. The, the situational awareness, which is a term the military likes to use, is being shaped by machines, by algorithms, by artificial intelligences. And in this context, actually, the idea of the agency of the <coughs> operative or the pilot is becoming increasingly uncertain because actually many decisions are being taken by the software and the human decisions are being oriented and guided in very significant ways by it. So I think that's actually, in many ways, the bigger challenge that we need to face today as opposed to fully autonomous <coughs> weapon systems which I think are so far going to be very restricted to uh, very constrained environments for example uh, uh, intercepting missiles from North Korea where it's very time sensitive and the margin of error is, uh, is, 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 is small uh, in these, when it comes to targeted assassinations I think or things of that like I think fully autonomous systems are still quite some, far, some, some way away. Um, a huge portion of the United States um, budget goes to defense. Um, do you see the evolution of the battlefield as um, making war more economical so that um, the United States would eventually be able to shrink the defense budget due to the advancements that are being made? I think, I mean, the way I would approach this is I think the challenge is actually going to be whether you can, in the long run, distinguish between defense budgets and homeland security budgets. If the battle space is disappearing, if increasingly there's no inside and outside, uh, we may conceive all of it as, if, as in, through the lens of security. In fact, I think it's very revealing that precisely as war has lost the kind of contours that we've known and all recognized for long periods in our history, the term of security has become predominant. And the term of security is different from the term of war because war implies uh, moments of war and peace. It has a temporality and it has an end. Security is never ending. You always have to secure uh, uh, whatever you've decided is under the need of security. There are always potential threats that are, that are emergent. And in that context, I think that whether defense budgets go up or down, the general securitization of our societies is likely to proceed. Certainly as long as populations, as ourselves, demand a form of absolute security. Governments are really in many ways responding to what they perceive, but I think also what public opinion expresses, which is uh, you know, an intolerance of risk and insecurity. In the back. Picking up on that point that you just made, doesn't an event like Las Vegas on Sunday kind of belie the notions of you know greater and greater securitization through better and better surveillance? I mean, there's there's some kind of paradox there, and I'm not sure how you would address that. Well, events like the, the ones that occurred uh, recently, there's of course an American context in which there's a, you know, a rather great availability of certain weapons in this country than you might find elsewhere. But there's an underlying, I think, tendency, which is that the means of destruction are becoming ever more available to individuals, to small groups. And that, I think, is, going to, is a factor of long-term instability and insecurity that the monopoly of violence of the state is one that's likely to become ever more fragile. Whether this, sh I don't think necessarily that these events, well, undoubtedly there's no way to fully secure society. And I think as long as we 
convince ourselves that there is an end point where society will be finally safe, the more we feed into this, in, in my view. And clearly, uh, it isn't possible to attain a state of full security. Um, and in some, some ways, I think, as societies, we need to at least show some willingness to live with a certain degree of insecurity. That's not to say that things can't be done to reduce that security, but it cannot be premised on reaching a state of uh, where security is absolute. Thank you.